If you're a chief marketing officer or marketing leader, without a doubt, one of the hardest things that you have to do is to attribute ROI in your marketing activities, right? Whether it's annual ROI on everything you did last year or uh, even worse or harder, trying to project ROI and build a marketing plan based around ROI for the following year. It's a huge problem and one that without a doubt is on all of your minds. Well, that is exactly what we're gonna tackle in this video. It's important for every marketing leader to understand the world that we live in. 20 years ago, calculating digital marketing ROI was relatively easy because you really were only looking at your website, maybe some banner ads, possibly SEO, depending on when we're talking about, and maybe eventually Google ads, okay? Social media didn't exist. Email marketing was relatively new, but not really widely commercialized. It was easy. Fast forward to today, and you've got hundreds, if not thousands, of customer touch points. And you've got hundreds of different marketing channels and strategies. And you've got to figure out how to pull the ROI out of that, or at least pull the numbers out to try to calculate ROI. It's a daunting task, right? And so how do we kind of look at the landscape? Well, the most important thing for us to remember is that it is both a quantity and a quality gain when trying to attribute ROI. When we think about some of the more basic metrics in digital marketing, right? Uh, let's, let's start with a view. So that's, that's a very high level, top of funnel uh, uh, type of metric. So a high quality view of a post or a video or whatever they're looking at. It could also be a, a, a listen, like on a podcast, right? So a high quality view leads to a high quality click or action. A high quality action leads to a high quality conversion. A high quality conversion leads to a high quality customer. And a high quality customer leads to business growth. So how do we get to high quality? You can't get to high quality in most cases without first hitting quantity. And that's because we have to test. And that's a huge part of trying to attribute ROI is testing. So at the end of this video, we're going to talk about the attribution models that we want to use when calculating ROI. But before we get into that, I want to talk a little bit about how to calculate ROI on the granular level as well as the, the, the micro level and the macro level. Why is it important? Sounds obvious, but we'll cover it. I want to talk about the five metrics that I believe are the most important. And out of the hundreds of different metrics out there, these five are some of the more common ones and the ones that you're really gonna to wanna to focus on. And then we'll end with some of those attribution models that you can use to try to both attribute ROI to certain activities, but also project ROI for future results. Hey everyone, if you didn't already know, I'm John Timmerman. I'm the founder and CEO of Good Monster. We are a commerce marketing agency. Um, I've also dabbled in a few other things like uh, VR and AR, uh, but I love business and I love marketing and I love sales and I love the strategy behind it. It's my absolutely favorite thing in business. Uh, so if you like that, hit the subscribe button, check me out on my other social media channels, hit me up on my website, jtimmerman.com. It's where you can find all the good stuff. But let's get into ROI, shall we? Okay, first, why is ROI important? Sounds like a no-brainer. Well, a few different things. If you're a Fortune 100 company, you're on the stock market, you're a public company, I mean, you have people that are requiring that you generate an ROI. You have many stakeholders, you have leadership, you have a board, you have people, they're breathing down your neck. So if you're a marketing leader at a public company or a very large company, a well-funded company with VCs, you have to generate an ROI to keep your job. So now it's a job safety thing. If you're a small business, you have to generate ROI because you need to stay in business. If you're consistently not generating an ROI, you will go out of business. Cash is oxygen. Revenue is oxygen. So that's why we need to generate an ROI. That being said, though, not every marketing activity generates an immediate ROI. This is such a hard sell to a lot of CEOs, definitely CFOs, and sometimes even COOs, also board members. 
So it's tough when you want to do a $100,000 brand marketing campaign and the way you're measuring it is brand lift and long tail revenue. It's hard, but it's important for you to remember, yes, it's hard, but that's why you're paid the big bucks. You need to be able to communicate to your team and leadership and board and investors and anybody else that this $100,000 or million dollars or whatever scale you're at is investing in our brand. And the best way to grow a business is through growing your brand. And I love to use this example, no matter whether I'm talking to a Fortune 100 company or I'm talking to a one-person company. Let's take the example of Nike. And I like to use Nike because Nike uh, pulled themselves off of Amazon a year or two ago, right? They're one, they're the, one of the biggest brands to just pull all their products off of Amazon. There, you might be able to find some Nikes on there being sold by a third party, but Nike's doing a pretty good job at shutting it down. So Nike is one of the most well-known brands on the planet. And if Nike runs a TV ad, let's say, uh, or digital ads showing that they're coming out with a new shoe, but they didn't have any call to action, no call to action at all. Not like go to our website and buy this. No, go here and buy it, go to the store and buy it. If they did none of that, they just said, you know, Nike X, the newest shoe for your collection. And they made it look really cool. It doesn't matter that they didn't have a call to action because people would go find wherever they are selling Nike X's. And Nike fanatics that love the brand and they have a shoe collection full of Nikes will reach to the ends of the earth to try to find out where these shoes are. And in fact, if it's a limited release or something even more private, it makes, it makes the demand even greater. And that's because Nike has such a powerful brand. So I love using this example. Uh, oh, one more thing is the reason they could pull their products off of Amazon is because the brand, the Nike brand is as big, if not bigger, at least it has more history than Amazon. They don't need Amazon because if they pull all their products off Amazon and put them on their own website, that won't really sell many, that won't sell less shoes, less Nikes, because people will just go to Amazon, look for Nikes, realize they're not there, so they'll go somewhere else. They'll go to Dick's Sporting Goods or uh, finishline.com or uh, Nike.com, or they'll walk into their local store that sells Nikes and go buy them there. So Nike's not going to make any less significant revenue or any significantly less revenue because they pulled off Amazon because their brand is so powerful. So I use that example when talking to any business or CEO about their brand, because it shows that if you Sorry, can, could you say that again? My apologies. I couldn't hear what you said. It's because I'm not talking to you, Siri. Anyways, so I use the example because if a company invests in growing their brand and they use customer feedback and prospective customer feedback and audience feedback to make sure they're doing it right, you build your brand so that it doesn't matter all the little marketing hacks and tricks and tactics that you do. If people love your brand, they will go find you no matter where you are, okay? Build your brand first and then reverse engineer backing into all the tactics like email marketing and SEO and PPC and things like that. Calculating the ROI from a brand building campaign or effort is much more difficult because it spreads down into all of the smaller micro tactics and channels. So I like to use a, it depends on the industry, but I like to generally use like a 60, 40 or 70, 30 split. 30 or 40% is all brand building and the rest is all the more tactical channel specific stuff. The brand building will lift everything up from a tactical uh, standpoint, right? And then all the tactics are just filling all the, the holes in the leaky bucket. So you're maximizing your marketing ROI coming from everything. ROI is important. It's oxygen for a business, whether you're a small business or a large business. But you need to understand how to calculate and more importantly, attribute the ROI coming from all the small stuff so that you can calculate the overall ROI and make sure that is positive. Obviously your overall annual marketing ROI should always be positive. But then you can back in to projecting the following 
year's ROI based on the efforts of what worked this year and trying to use trends and things that are happening in the industry to make projections on where to invest uh, for ROI the following year, right? So that's why the smaller, the 70%, the micro uh, tactics and channels are so important, even though brand marketing is what will launch your company to the moon. Okay, and this probably goes without saying, but I feel like I should cover it in the video just for somebody out there who's really trying to dig in and learn everything about ROI, but how to calculate ROI. It's the same for small little micro campaigns. Like, hey, we ran an email uh, campaign. We sent out three emails and it brought in this much money, right? How much did you spend on the email campaign and how much did it come back to you? And all you do is you simply do the math. If you spent $100 on that, those three emails, and it brought you back $100, that's a 100% ROI, a return on your investment. If you spent $100 on those three emails and it brought you back $1,000, now it's a 1,000% ROI. So that's the easy math. And you would do the same thing even if you're doing a large campaign. So let's say a, a company spent a million dollars on a spring ad campaign or media campaign, whatever. Spent a million dollars, video production, agency fees, ad spend, the whole thing. So I spent a million dollars and it brought in $5 million. That's a 5x return on investment or a 500% return on investment, okay? So you just do the math and it can be done for the entire year. We spent $10 million on marketing and it generated $100 million in revenue, okay? That's a 10x return on my investment or a 1,000% return on my investment. Okay, so the math doesn't change whether it's micro or macro. But as you're doing the calculations, you're gonna be doing them at the ground level. You're gonna be doing them on a micro level. I'm gonna calculate the ROI of my email marketing. I'm gonna calculate the ROI of my paid media. I'm gonna calculate the ROI of my influencer marketing. I'm gonna calculate the ROI of our web development firm or our UX firm who's consistently trying to improve the performance of our website. And you keep going. I'm going to I'm going to calculate the ROI of our social media activities. That's our community management, our uh, our created posts, uh, our influencer marketing, as I mentioned already, could be grouped in with this. Our uh, user generated content, everything. Okay. Here's our ROI of social media. That one's a bit tricky because there's so many facets of social media. But if you have one agency measuring or, or uh, managing your social media, what did you invest in that agency and any other paid media on top of that? And then what uh, return on investment came from that? What revenue came from that? So you're going to calculate the ROI down here. And then you're going to, uh, at the end of the quarter or halfway through the year or at the end of the year, you're going to group together all of those activities, all of the campaigns, which hopefully, if you're organized, you already have them sort of saved and, and organized in a way that you can gather them all together. Those numbers, spreadsheets are great, tons of software programs out there. But you're going to use all the ROI from these smaller campaigns and marketing channels, add them together to get the overall ROI of all of your marketing activities. Then you take those numbers and you, you compare that with your CFO's numbers, which is here's how much we spent on marketing and here's how much revenue we generated, uh, you know, new revenue or repeat customer revenue generally from marketing. Compare those numbers and see if they match up. Okay, next, let's dive into the five most important metrics to digital marketing return on investment. Now, as I said at the beginning of this video, there's so many different small little metrics that you can uh, focus on or that you should really be managing. But if you're just starting out or you're looking for the most important ones to focus on, maybe you're you're reviewing uh, you know, your previous quarter, previous year's results, or you're trying to project new ones for the following quarter or the following year. But the first one we want to focus on is website traffic. We live in an age where there's many places for people to buy your products if you're exercising your right to be on all of them in some cases. So in our world, a lot of times we're juggling Amazon revenue, which is a marketplace we're juggling website revenue, and we're juggling retail revenue, right? Maybe your products are sold through target.com or walmart.com or something like that, right? But your website is going to be your most profitable. It's where you own your customers. And with the disappearance of third-party 
cookies. Uh, we're going to see the uh, an importance of gathering your own data, and the best place that you can do that is on your own website, in your own email, you know, and in your own possibly membership programs, things like that. But your website is your home. That's where you can control the best you possibly can on the internet. And so generating website traffic is one of the best goals to generate ROI, no matter what your business is. You know, we're focusing mostly on e-commerce businesses here, but even if you're a B2B company, the more website traffic you can get to your website, it shows the more people are paying attention to what you offer. Now, lots of things can happen after that so that it makes it not valuable, like people leaving your site right away, things like that. But website traffic is one of the most basic and most valuable places to measure and to try to optimize in order to generate an ROI. The strategy behind what your website does is how you do that. So if you're a typical e-commerce site, you've built a site on Shopify, there's all the tools in the world to generate uh, reports on heat maps and clicks and customer journeys and things like that. But the more traffic you get to your site, the more likely you are to be able to convert somebody to a customer. Remember what I said, high quality clicks lead to high quality conversions, high quality conversions lead to high quality customers and organic growth. Okay. So website traffic is one of the most important things to measure on a regular basis and then use that number, add in one of the next most important, which is number two, and that is sales conversions. So sales conversions are the second most important digital marketing metric, especially, well, really exclusively for e-commerce companies selling something online because that will tell you whether your website is giving that traffic what they want or what they expect. It will also tell you whether your product is doing a good job selling itself or if your marketing team is doing a good job selling your product on the website. Because if you have 100,000 people coming into your website, uh, but only 100 of those people are purchasing the product, you know that something is not right, okay? So the second most important metric, conversion rate, sales conversion rate, will tell you how successful your website is at converting those people to customers. Now, I get asked all the time, what is an acceptable conversion rate? You can Google you know, industry averages with our clients in the, in the e-commerce space, you know, we're seeing anything from a 3% conversion rate. Um, it can go as low as 2% in like slow seasons for a seasonal business. Uh, uh, but, but let's say two or 3% on the low end. And from there it can go way up depending on a specific campaign or time like black Friday, cyber Monday, you know, but it can get up into the 20% range on crazy successful campaigns. But overall, average that out. And in the e-commerce space, you're going to be looking at, at uh, probably around a 5% conversion rate is like normal or average for us over the course of an entire year across our entire customer base. But like I said, that number goes up and down all the time. Um, we have a client that's been sort of stagnant at around 4% for a while. Uh, and we just redid a campaign and launched it and it got a 9% conversion rate over the course of a couple of months. So anything can be turned around, right? It's all in the message and the creative and, uh, you know, the way you're kind of communicating it. So conversion rate is the second most important, uh, metric in my opinion. Okay. So number three is, uh, leads generated. Now in the e-commerce space, we're always talking about sales, as I mentioned, sales conversions and you know how many, how much revenue can we get, um, other metrics, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But leads generated is something that is huge in the B2B space and the service space. So our clients that we help uh, with their digital marketing, are we're, we're constantly focusing on leads because that's how you get to a sale. And in like a B2B space, for instance, a lot of times there's a sales team involved. And so the leads are what the sales team then reaches out to or connects with to try to close the deal offline or in email or something like that. But leads generated for product uh, D2C businesses is also huge and very important. And we're starting to see the adoption of D2C uh, direct-to-consumer businesses and e-commerce companies start to utilize 
lead generation and funnel strategies because they're realizing that once you get somebody into your family, into your community of leads, if you can nurture them like has been done in the B2B space and the in the consumer service space forever, if you can nurture them, they're more likely to buy a product later on down the road, right? They're more likely if you send them an email to buy a product finally after following you and getting value from your community for six months. They're more likely to go out to a store and see your product on the shelf and buy it because they've been a part of your community for six months. So leads generated, in my opinion, is one of the really underutilized uh, uh, tactics in e-commerce, but it is one that is really powerful. Here's why it's underutilized. As I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of pressure from CEOs and CFOs and board members to generate revenue, to generate ROI. And lead generation typically doesn't result in quick ROI. You have to nurture that lead. You have to give them value. After you give them value and you've earned their trust, then they may think about making a purchase. And so that's why a lot of marketing teams don't focus on lead generation. They go straight for the jugular and they try to make the sale with Facebook ads and YouTube ads and Instagram ads and TikTok ads, right? Click here to buy. That's how it typically works. So if you can focus on lead generation and then nurturing them with, again, some of the tried and true things. Let's just use a makeup company, right? Makeup is a huge industry. It's highly profitable. There's thousands of makeup brands there. There's influencers that are coming out with their own makeup companies. And it's, it's a widely uh, successful and high growth uh, space. So makeup companies are starting to do a really good job at nurturing their community on social channels. Uh, they're putting out makeup tutorials and how-tos. And some of them, uh, Glossier is one of them. I use them as an example quite a bit. On their blog, they're doing a lot of, it's not how-tos, but it's like, here's one of our customers and here's how they do their skincare routine daily. They're nurturing their community there. What companies like makeup companies can do that's really amazing is they can start to pull that into signing up for a club, a free club, which is basically like an email newsletter, right? An email list or a text club or maybe a private membership community inside of their website where it's free to join and there's lots of resources, makeup tutorials and you know, private makeup live webinars and sessions that you can attend, things like that. Create a community and generate leads into the community because the community then will act as a raving fan base who are going to buy your products over and over and over again. They're going to buy different makeup uh, products. They're going to recommend it to their friends and they're going to try to get their friends to join the community. So CrossFit, huge uh, raving fan base. Um, whether you like it or not. And the people who are part of the CrossFit community uh, act as ambassadors to try to get their friends to come to a CrossFit class with them and, 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 and you know, join the class and try the class out. So the example could be a lot of CrossFit gyms offer free classes. They'll offer like, you know, a, a free class, you come with a friend or, you know, a free week or something like that. That's sort of like generating a lead. You come in, you try the class out, you love it. You're sore, but you feel good. You sweat a lot. You feel really energized. And then if, you, if you're in a good place and you feel like it's a good fit for you, then you'll convert, you'll pay your membership, and you'll join the club to experience the CrossFit uh, workout style, right? Makeup companies can do this. Shoe companies can do this. You know, Shoe companies can invite people into their uh, ecosystem and their email list or their text list to uh, get tips on style, you know, style tips from uh, maybe an ambassador or an influencer that are only private to that community, right? Anyways, my point is, as I get wicked off track here, uh, is that lead generation is an underutilized aspect to funnel ROI in to your brand that a lot of e-commerce companies don't use if they're selling a product. It's generally something that the B2B space or the consumer service space utilizes. So pay attention to lead generation. How many email subscribers are you getting on a weekly or a, or a monthly basis? That number should be going up. The rate should be going up. Your subscriber rate should be going up if you're really, uh, you know, pedal to the metal. Uh, if you're text marketing, 
Uh, that's another place. Chat bots can even be a, a part of this where you can generate leads from chat bots or, or even live chat, real people, you know, live chat. They can answer questions and bring people in as a lead. You can collect their information. You can send them a guide for free. Lead generation is a great metric to measure uh, and, and one I highly suggest for D2C brands, B2B brands, and everybody in between. Okay, number four, customer retention rate or um, customer churn is the bad part, you know, customers leaving. So, how, you know, can you retain your customers? That's a metric that you want to you wanna make sure that you're measuring. How often are your customers coming back and repeat purchasing? That is highly dependent on your business model. Are you a subscription business? If so, you want to make sure customer churn is very low, as low as possible. You want to make sure your customers are coming back and purchasing. If you're not a membership company, your people don't subscribe to your product. It's like a one-time purchase or an infrequent purchase. You want to try to make sure you understand how long, what is, you know, how long does it take people to come back and make a purchase again? What is your sort of sales life cycle? What's your sales cycle like? Uh, and in most cases, this is where you can get creative as a marketer and add upsells um, and sometimes cross sells. So if you, you'll you notice if you walk into a Lowe's or a Home Depot and um, you buy a washer or dryer, they want to sell you a uh, maintenance plan, you know, five one year or five year maintenance plan or something like that. That's because they know if you buy a washer or dryer, you're probably not going to come back and buy another washer or dryer for like a decade or more unless you move. So they want to try to figure out a way to cross sell something or upsell you on uh, something. In this case, I guess it's probably a cross sell because they're selling you another product that it's another product that adds value, perceived value to your washer and dryer. An upsell would be like, oh, you want to buy this $500 washer? Well, this $700 one has this, so you should buy that one. That's an upsell, right? So uh, that's the reason why you see that in a lot of stores. They're trying to add on value to increase the average order value, which is another metric, very important, but not on this, not on this list right now. Um, they're trying to increase the average order value, but they're also trying to get you to have some, they're trying to get you to, pay them for more stuff on a reoccurring basis. So it might be a plan where you have to pay, uh, you know, $10 a month to access the maintenance plan. Sometimes it is a one-time upfront, you know, fee for five years of coverage is like $159 or something like that. But that's just one example. Another example might be if you go and, uh, actually I have a perfect example. I use this company quite a bit too. No Bull Project uh, is a shoe company in the CrossFit space, actually. They were just valued at $500 million. They sponsored the CrossFit Games. No Bull has an amazing customer base. First of all, they've got an amazing brand. Second of all, they've got maybe five different shoe styles, but they come in hundreds of different colors and they release new colors every month and every season. Colors and designs and, and, and you know, Shoes is one thing people collect. So you, they have raving fans that have 10 different pairs of the same exact shoe, but different colors and different patterns. So their customer retention rate is high because they have a high quality product. They have a high quality brand and they're constantly coming out with new variations that people want to buy. So they're probably tracking their customer retention rate and trying to make sure that they're coming out with shoe designs that people are still buying. And the moment they start coming out with designs that people don't buy, they can say, you know what? This product style is something people didn't like. We're not going to come out with this kind of pattern or this color ever again because it did fairly poorly. So measuring your customer retention rate is really important. It's really important to make sure that you're paying attention to that number and making adjustments based on if that number's going down, that means you're not doing something right in your customer's eyes. If that number's going up, hopefully you know why they are coming back and trust you with their money over and over and over again. Sometimes it's shifting your business model to adding some more products or more accessories that people will come back and buy more and more and more. Um, Apple comes out with the iPhone. They come out with new models pretty frequently. 
because they have a great brand and they know every Apple customer is going to want that new model. So they're going to trade in their old model and they're going to buy the new model. Their customers are going to stay with them for a long time. I don't know where my iPhone is, but I've been an Apple user for, I don't know, a decade or however long the iPhone has been out uh, because Apple's got a great brand. And so they've retained me as a customer throughout that entire time means they're doing something right. And the last, the fifth most important metric, in my opinion, is customer lifetime value. And I'm sure I'll get a lot of marketers out there saying like, oh, customer lifetime value, like it's, it's projecting too far out. Here's the reason why, is because I talked about how important brand building is, and that it's a long-term thing. Um, SEO takes a long time to get ranked in the the first page of Google, and it's sometimes difficult to stay there. It's a long-term investment. You need to have an idea of what your customer lifetime value is because it will help you justify some of the more challenging things to attribute an ROI to, like a brand, like a video campaign that's trying to build your brand, like uh, offline marketing activities. I know this video is about digital marketing, but if you're a large company, you're doing billboards, you're doing TV, you're doing print, you're doing some of the more traditional advertising to build your brand, then you need to know what your customer lifetime value is in order to justify that investment. If you know we're going to be investing in our brand, it's going to cost a million dollars, but our, in our, in our customer lifetime value is significant enough to pay that back based on our projections for how many people will make purchases, how many new customers we'll get this year it can justify the budget for that campaign. If your customer lifetime value is like $10, that's a really low number. And so it's going to be hard. You're going to need a load of customers to justify a $10 customer lifetime value in order to put a million dollars into an outdoor advertising or a TV campaign. So calculating your customer lifetime value is huge and very important to making sure that you're making educated decisions, not only in the short-term ROI, like sending out an email, which will generate a bunch of revenue right away, but also the brand building campaigns and the, the campaigns that you're doing that don't have a direct connection to immediate ROI. So how do you calculate customer lifetime value? Calculating customer lifetime value is relatively easy. For, first of all, if you don't have a business yet, if you're building your business, you're building your market, marketing plan, it's going to be hard for you to, you don't have any customers. So you won't know. You'll have to take some industry data. And honestly, if you're just starting your business, don't even worry about this fifth metric because you don't have the information yet to make an educated decision or calculation. But if you do have a business, go into your Shopify or go into your uh, e-commerce platform and pick you know, your top 10 customers. Average out the amount of uh, purchases that they've made and then attribute your average order value and multiply those numbers. If your average order value is a hundred and the customer purchases, uh, the, the top 100 customers that you have have made three purchases on average, then 100 times three is $300. That's your customer lifetime value up to this point. That's one way to do it. You could also very easily just go in uh, and if you have this already set up in Shopify or Big Commerce, maybe you already have a plugin that's calculating this. Uh, some of these platforms will calculate your customer lifetime value, and they'll go in and just show you over the course that you've had this customer, they have spent five hundred dollars or they have spent a thousand dollars. So you can take your top one hundred customers and just average out the amount of money they've spent on your website, and that's your customer lifetime value. Now, this is digital marketing lifetime value. If you're a large brand and you have retail channels that you're selling on, you have Amazon that you're selling on, and your website, it becomes a little bit more complicated. You can use your website to, to sort of guesstimate because it's probably rare that people are buying your products on your website and they're going to the store and buying it and they're going to Amazon and buying it. It's possible. I mean, it's, it's, it's probable that there are people doing that, but generally people settle into one channel that they like to purchase. I shop at Wegmans. If I go to Wegmans, Wegmans is where I'm going to generally buy most of my household goods. I just don't on Amazon. I go to Amazon for one-time purchases for most of my stuff. If I want an organizer for my desk, I'm going to search on Amazon. If I want a you know, new pen set, I'm going to go on Amazon. If I want 
uh, a new pair of shoes. I'm going to check on Amazon first because I know I can return them easily if I don't fit, if they don't fit. But if I don't find what I like on Amazon, I'm going to go into a store because I need to try them on. Right. So people settle into their channels. So finding calcu calculating customer lifetime value is easiest if you have website data already. It becomes much more difficult because you don't have granular data on Amazon. They won't they won't share information about their specific customers on Amazon. And most retail stores don't know or have a lot of the individual uh, information on their customers. So your website is the best place to calculate accurate customer lifetime value. But then you can use that on other channels as well. Okay, so as promised, we're gonna talk about the attribution models that you can use to try to attribute ROI to a certain channel or campaign. All attribution means is that you want to attribute the efforts of a particular campaign to a sale. So as I mentioned earlier in this video, let's take an example of a current customer pathway. There's so many different channels and so many different places for us to be influenced by products. So a, a typical customer journey might be, I'm looking for a pair of shoes. I'm going to go to Amazon because they have free returns. I'm going to go to Amazon and look for the shoes. I'm going to search off all of the options there. I see some good ones, but not quite the right fit. So I'm going to go over to Google and I'm going to look up top 10 pair of shoes for running. I'm going to find probably a review site and the review site's going to have their top 10 uh, shoes. I'm going to look through them and I'm going to see the one that they rate the best. I'm going to click on that one. And that one maybe brings me to the website of the shoe brand itself. And then on the shoe, the website, I'm going to make the decision of, is this the shoe that I want to purchase from the website? Do they give free returns? How's the price? Then I might go back to Google and I might search for that shoe and look at all the other sites that are selling that shoe to figure out, can I get one cheaper somewhere else? And does somewhere else offer free shipping or free return shipping or something better for me, right? Then I might go over to social media and I might compare other people posting about the shoes. Take all of this information and then go back to where I'm most comfortable and I found that pair of shoes to make the actual purchase. When I make that purchase, what influenced me? What do I attribute or what does the brand attribute to that sale? That is an attribution model. Or I guess an attribution model is building the system of what actually made me buy that thing. So let's look at a few of the common attribution models. So one of the most basic attribution models is the last click model. That is the last click that I made before the purchase, that's where you attribute the sale to. That's what generated the ROI. So if I clicked on an ad from Instagram and then I made the purchase, it's because of the Instagram ad. Now, there's some flaws with this because it doesn't take into account brand building. It doesn't take into account anything else that influenced me like the review sites, like a Google search, which is SEO. Uh, maybe I'm subscribed to an email where uh, you've been nurturing me with your lead you know, the lead generation part of the funnel I was talking about. So last click attribution. Yes, it says that whatever I clicked on led me to the sale, but it doesn't tell the whole story. Uh, the next model is the opposite of last click. It's first click attribution. First click attribution attributes the sale to the first click somebody takes. So let's use the same scenario. If I went to Amazon, I didn't find what I'm looking for. I went over to Google. And I went to Google and I found the review site. I clicked on the review site and that is what the shoe company should attribute the sale to, the review site. Because the review site was my first impression on the shoes and it was good enough to keep me searching. So first click attribution is a solid model, but again, it has its downfalls. It doesn't take into account the rest of the funnel, the rest of the influences, okay? It doesn't take into account that last click that I made on the ad you know, when I finally decide to make the purchase or whatever it is. So valuable, but still has its downsides. The next model is a linear attribution model. And this takes the whole channel from Amazon. Uh, well, I guess Amazon, I didn't find the shoes. So from the review site to the website, to social media, it, it gives equal credit, equal attribution uh, to all of the channels and all of the touch points. So it says, okay, this purchase was for $100, these pair of shoes. Now we need to take into account 
each one of these channels and look at all of them as helping to make that sale. Now, that sounds like a no-brainer, like, duh, well, if it didn't hurt, it helped, right? But the flaw here is that touch points are not all created equal. A review site has a lot more power because it's social proof. It's somebody else recommending the product. Whereas an ad generally doesn't have as much power because there's not a lot of social proof unless the ad is showing a review or social proof or something like that, right? Uh, an email is a lot more valuable usually because you've already won them as a lead. But how did you win them as a lead? So the linear attribution model, I'm not a huge fan of because it doesn't account for different influences at different levels. Uh, but it is a model people use and it is one that you can kind of see the customer journey all the way to the sale. The next attribution model is the time decay attribution model. It's very similar to linear, but instead of assigning equal like 10% credit to this one and 10% to this one and 10% to this one, it, at, it, it attributes more uh, uh, credit to the touch points that happen closer to the sale. So if, if I looked at a review site a month ago and I decided not to make a purchase, and then I saw an ad and I clicked on the ad and I got to the website, but I decided not to make a purchase. But then two days later, I went directly to Google. I went to Google, I searched for the website, and then I clicked on the website and I made a purchase. The time decay model says SEO is the most important, okay? Because that's where I clicked and I made the purchase. And then immediately after that, or lo lower, is the ad. Because the ad happened, the ad click just happened a couple of days ago. The review site is much, much less because that happened a month ago. You know, it's got its downfalls, but I really like this one because we are, live in a society where we're hit with 10,000 ads a day and we forget all the time. And chances are, I forgot I even went to that review site a month ago. Sure, subconsciously, it might've left an impression, but I like this one because it allocates more credit to, or it attributes more credit to the things that happen right around the purchase, which in today's day and age is probably more accurate. And the last attribution model we're going to talk about today is the position attribution model, the position-based attribution model. And it allocates the majority of the credit to the first and the last touch point with less in the middle. This one could be, could be good. I don't like this one as much as the time decay model, but we do use this one actually. And it does make sense in some cases because the first impression... Um, this makes the most sense in purchases that happen in a short period of time. I should say that, right? Because like I said in the, in the last one, people forget everything all the time. <laughs> so the position base makes sense in short sales cycles because their first impression is the, is the most important one. If I, uh, if I see an ad and it's for a Apple watch band and I absolutely love it and I go in and I follow that Instagram account because I love it. Uh, that's my first impression. That was a very important metric or touch point because it got me into the community. And then everything out, the likes and the clicks and things like that in between, they don't matter as much because I'm already sort of in there, but I'm, I haven't made the purchase yet. Then that last click I make on an Instagram post where I can click the Instagram shop and I can buy it right there, that's most important because it actually got me over the hurdle to the sale. So this one's really well. It does work in longer sales cycles, but it's harder to track all the stuff in the middle. And it's harder to say that that first impression a month or two months or three months ago was really so important that it got me in. Um, that's why I like the time decay model a little bit better for longer sales cycles. And I like the position based attribution model a little bit better for shorter sales cycles. So you can use a combination of these things. You can use the, a combination of these models for different products or different categories or different channels. Um, but that's an explanation of the attribution model. I hope it makes sense to all of you out there. This is a super long video, so hopefully you got a lot out of it. I tried to make this a bit like a tutorial on how to get digital marketing ROI, and I hope I served you well. As always, thank you for watching. I'm not going to go through the spiel of subscribe and do all that stuff. But if you love this video, do some good stuff with it. And I hope I can see you in the next video. Thanks and have a great day.